You've tuned in to the Community Cats Podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats Podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I have been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we are speaking with Ellen Carroza. Ellen graduated from the SUNY Delhi Veterinary Technology Program in 1996 and started her career out in research medicine and a small country clinic. That was not enough. After moving to Washington, D.C. in 1997, she began working at Worrell and began to appreciate shelter and rescue work. But something was missing. Everything revolved around the dogs, onward and upwards to a few small clinics in the Alexandria area, and the same trend was present. Everything was all about the canine patient when it came to care, and the feline patient was not given the priority it should. Then she found Capital Cat Clinic in Arlington in 2002, now Nova Cat Clinic, under the ownership of Dr. Marcus Brown, and has never looked back. There, she has found the freedom to practice high-quality feline medicine care where it mattered. Over the course of her 20 years as a licensed technician, she has fostered and raised hundreds of neonatal kittens, and with the help of Dr. Brown, Novacat established their own feline memorial fund where they are able to help other community rescues by taking in their high-risk cases and providing necessary medical care. Rescues and shelters, including the National Kitten Coalition, have come as far as Pennsylvania for physical consultations and phone call consultations from across the country. Even Hannah Shaw, the famous kitten lady, is one of her clients. Currently, Ellen lectures on fading kitten syndrome on the veterinary technology circuit and has written papers on neonatal blood transfusions and plasma infusions done on a budget. She firmly believes that every life deserves a chance, even if they are a day old. If a rescuer is willing to put the dedication to take care of their neonate, there's no reason for the veterinary team not to try to help. This is what we are here to do. Ellen, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So, Ellen, how did you get started in animal welfare? Gosh, I've always been involved with some sort of animal care, basically started with my parents and a bunny in the backyard, you know, being surrounded by animals growing up. And when I started working at the Washington Animal Rescue League, it kind of blossomed from there. I really started to appreciate animal rescue and animal welfare from that point on, actually getting immersed in it and really learning about what's really involved in it. It's a lot of work. And I think a lot of people don't realize what's really involved in animal welfare and rescue. I really started to appreciate how involved you have to be in animal welfare, especially from the rescue point of working at the welfare league itself. So it seems like today we are going to be focusing so much of our conversation around neonates and day-old or several-day-old kittens. How did you find your passion for those little guys? I love cats. (laughs) I love cats. Oh my gosh, my whole entire house is decorated in cat stuff, and I love the little tiny kittens. I think one of my first experiences of getting to raise a tiny kitten from start to finish just was the most amazing experience, just holding it in my hand and watching it grow from start to finish and watching their personality blossom. It was the most amazing thing. And then I realized this is what I wanted to do. And at any point that someone said, I had a kitten, I was like, I will raise it for you. Give it to me. And I would carry kittens around in backpacks and in purses, everything. And one of the first kittens my husband and I raised together, we took her everywhere we went. We had a little leather backpack and we would take her to the movie theater. We would take her to dinner with us. She was a little tiny C-section kitten that we got at the Washington Animal Rescue League when I was working there. And she lived to a good old age age of 16 before she passed away from cancer. She was just amazing. From that point on, I mean, we have raised hundreds of kittens together. And every single time we get a new baby, we're just amazed by them. It's addictive. 
Over the years, you've obviously learned a lot of what to do and what not to do. If somebody comes across a litter of kittens out in the community, do you have some words of wisdom for them? If you do not know what to do, take them to your local veterinary office or take them to a shelter and find somebody to help you. Do not do it on your own. If you have no idea what you're doing, you will actually harm the babies more than you are helping them. We see so much stuff go wrong. Even though your heart may be in the right place, find somebody to help you. Don't do it on your own first go around. So should we just assume that there's a mom there or are there signs of behavior from the kittens to tell us that there hasn't been a mom around? I mean, will kittens be quiet? Will they be loud? Are there any signs for us to know whether we should just leave them be? It depends where they are. If they're in an area where they look like they're in a nest and they're curled up quiet and comfortable, they're most likely have been hidden by mom. Now, if they're dumped in the yard and they're all of a sudden you're just like, oh, look, there's a kitten in the middle of my yard. Mom probably was like in the middle of moving her babies and was spooked and dropped that baby. Obviously, you're going to want to pick that baby up and wait for mom to see if she's going to come around and see if she's actually physically looking for that baby. If the babies seem limp and weak, obviously they have been there for a while and she probably abandoned them. If they're dirty and covered in maggots, they probably have been there for a while. If they sound very weak when they meow, they've probably been abandoned. But if they seem comfortable and quiet and content, then they're probably being taken care of and you should leave them alone and wait for mom to come around and and trap her appropriately. Have somebody either rescue her, get her spayed, and let her take care of her babies, get her back out in the community, and get those babies into a foster situation. So then let's say someone does pick up a a bottle babe kitten. What are the challenges that neonates have in those first several weeks of life? Well, if you pick up a bottle baby, it's like having a regular child. Sometimes it's even more. You have made a huge commitment to that little life. If it is within a week old, you're going to be up every hour to every two hours. That baby needs help going to the bathroom. That baby needs to be fed every single hour. Those babies can have really bad diarrhea. They can have parasites. They can die from diarrhea. They die from diarrhea all the time. In my lecture, one of my famous slides is the Oregon Trail for you died of dysentery. And everybody kind of giggles at that, but it's incredibly true. You know, children die of dysentery all the time, all over the world. And it's simply due to electrolyte imbalances. You know, you look on all of these forums and a lot of rescuers are like, my baby has a bacterial issue, I need clavamox, et cetera. It's not that. It's it's a lot simpler. Most of the time you're making very common mistakes with these babies and you're doing more harm than good for them. So you have to know what you're really doing with these little guys and you have to move quickly because you can't go, okay, I'm going to wait a day. Sometimes waiting a day, you've already lost that baby. So you have to really be on top of making sure that you're going to dedicate the time to these little guys because you're going to lose them pretty fast if you let them get sick. Yeah. When I looked through your presentation, you had a lot of information about balancing the formula amounts, using probiotics, using electrolytes, and then eventually even moving into using plasma. Are those sort of new techniques that have developed over the last 10 years or so? No, actually not. Most of that has been more used in puppies. Like I said, the canine has always been given more precedence in medical care. And, you know, a lot of people think dogs are worth more than the cats. And that was one of the things I was going through all of my pediatric books a couple of years ago going, there's something more I could be doing here. These babies are dying from diarrhea. I'm like, this baby needs a blood product. I'm going to give it some plasma. You know, I'm going to do just like what we did with a puppy and see how it does. And the kitten did great. It resolved wonderfully. None of the pediatric books said to give it to kittens. And I didn't understand why, whether or not they didn't just touch base saying, you know, let's give it to kittens or they just didn't touch on it because they didn't care. But it worked. 
plasma is a wonderful tool because it covers everything that you need. Because a lot of times these kittens with diarrhea is actually a protein loss, not just your electrolyte imbalance, but these kittens have a protein losing enteritis. Their whole entire intestines are just sloughing all of the important stuff out of it. They're pooping out all of the food all of their nutrients, they're not absorbing anything. And if we can create that proper balance again and actually get the proteins back in them, sometimes with just the plasma alone, sometimes they bounce back a lot quicker than they do with just lactated ringer solution, which a lot of people tend to fluid overload their babies. And so over the course of several years of using plasma and stuff, my rates of fading kittens went down significantly. So now I have a success rate of well over 80% with my babies. I lost one baby this year alone, and it wasn't due to fading kitten syndrome. It was due to a congenital defect, and he actually wound up dying of a renal dysplasia and not fading kitten. I have not lost one kitten from fading kitten syndrome this year at all. And I've had several faders, but they've all bounced back. That's excellent. Absolutely amazing news. I've dealt with many foster homes that have lost bottle babies over the years with fading kitten syndrome and other issues too that have plagued them and they just haven't been able to, you know, make it. And it's heartbreaking. It's you put so much time and effort into saving these little guys and you want to help them. You want to do what's best for them. And it's so hard to figure out what is best for them. It's terrible because you become so attached to these little guys and you can do so much. And sometimes it takes so little to do stuff for them. And there's that lack of the education, like I was saying, in veterinary medicine of what we can do. And sometimes all it takes is one or two mLs of blood plasma to bounce these little babies back. And a lot of veterinary places aren't willing to even do that for them. And they could be saving all of these babies. It doesn't take a lot to do it. And so that was my goal was how can we make this better? And I have to say, we've had a lot of success with it. And now let's take a moment to listen to a few words from our sponsors. Flashlight tag was fun when you were a kid, but no one wants to play hide and seek with their trap. Find your trap's location quickly and safely, even when you visit it at night with the Reveal Wild application for Samsung Galaxy, HTC One, Sony, Xperia, and other Android phones. Or go to tinyurl.com forward slash Reveal Wild. I want to talk a little bit about education. It sounds like much of what you've learned, you've learned kind of on the job, so to speak. Are veterinarians trained in this when they go to school, or is this something that has to be learned basically on the job? I mean, when I went to school 20 years ago now, you learn the basics. You learn anatomy, you learn cytology, all this kind of stuff. We learn very different things when you go to vet school versus veterinary technology. And when it comes to neonates, a lot of it is trial and error is what I want to say. You can only go by so much of what the books say, especially with cats, because the books say one thing, but the cat's going to do the complete opposite sometimes. So over the years, I would be like, well, that didn't work. And I lost it doing this. So I'm going to try this this time. And I'd be like, well, that worked. And this drug says I'm not allowed to use this because it, they didn't do drug testings of six weeks and older, but this kitten's two weeks and it's going to die. But if I don't try this drug, it's going to die anyway. So I'm going to try it. And so a lot of it is just absolute trial and error error. And a lot of it is off-label use, especially with the neonates. It is off-label use and a lot of trial and error, a lot of writing stuff down and explaining to the rescuer or to the owner of saying, you know, this is not how the drug is supposed to work. It is absolutely off-label use. It is not labeled for a neonate. I need to explain it to you very well. But if we don't give it a shot, you might have a dead kitten. And most of the time they're like, I will give it a try no matter what. So lots and lots of trial and error. And utilizing the experience of others. So I would assume like a mentoring program would be good with experienced bottle babe foster homes, neonate foster homes, and with a newer foster home that there should be a nice mentorship relationship. I think if there was going to be a mentorship 
I think a lot of the older fosters, they need to come together the fact that medicine is changing. The way fostering and caring for the neonates are changing and they have to be willing to understand change. Like I was saying earlier, if you look at the neonate forums or the foster forums, there's a lot of misinformation on there. I mean, it is cringing information on there. And if they're willing to take a step back and listen to the newer information, and, and the newer techniques that are out there, they'll be more successful with it. So if we can get the newer veterinarians that are graduating coming out to understand what's going on, I think that'd be wonderful. And if the veterinarians that are currently practicing that are really into neonates to listen to the newer information and they're willing to practice that kind of medicine, that would be wonderful too. But there's always going to be the, that, those, that set of group of people that are going to put their foot down and be like, I've been doing this forever. I'm not going to change my ways. And you're always going to have that issue. Right. My way or the highway type attitude. Right. Correct. The way at our clinic is like, what can we do to make it better? What can we change? What can we do to change our protocols to make us more successful? That's always our goal is how can we be more successful next time? One thing you do, though, mention is a bit of a Google alert type issue, which is don't trust everything that you see on the Internet or that you read on the Internet. Are there any specific Internet resources, though, that you do recommend or how would anybody access the cutting edge information if they're not working at your clinic? Definitely utilize National Kitten Coalition. If you are wanting to learn how to foster babies, they're an excellent resource go to. They're wonderful. They have lots of information. They have videos. You can have them come out and teach you how to work with these babies. Lots of local shelters will have neonate kitten courses. Go to those people. Do not go to these foster forums that people just give out all this misinformation. Go to the legit sites. National Kitten Coalition will tell you other sites that they do recommend. Feline clinics, if you go to the American Association of Feline Practitioners, their websites, they'll have a whole bunch of other feline clinics listed. Those are the people for you to be contacting. If it's feline related only, those people are the ones to go to about feline medicine and feline related issues. So I understand you have a bit of a, uh, you have a memorial fund established at your clinic to help support the life-saving efforts that you're doing for kittens. Is there a way for people to be able to donate to that fund? Yeah. Um, if you go to our clinic's website for Nova Cat Clinic, if you click on client resources, you'll see the Chris Griffey Memorial Fund. And there's a way to either donate online or to physically send money to our memorial fund. We would love donations. I work on like very, very little money, sometimes <laughs> my own money, sometimes Dr. Brown gives money. But we started the memorial fund because we noticed that we were paying out of our, our own pockets the entire time. Time. And Dr. Brown was like, you know, we should be setting up a memorial fund. We dedicated the memorial fund after um, one of our own assistants of 10 plus years passed away. We help all the community cats in the area. We have so many shelters give us babies that are super high risk. National Kitten Coalition has given us babies. Washington Animal Rescue League, Washington Humane, Metro Ferals, etc. They'll be giving us babies that are on death's door. And this is the money that we use to turn these babies around. We buy plasma, et cetera, and we rehabilitate them and get them adopted out. And through our adoption program, they get spayed, neutered, they get all their vaccines, they get microchipped, and we send them right back out the door. And so far, we've I think we've adopted out over 150 kittens through the program. How could people find you if they're interested in finding out more information? You can find me on the NovaCat Clinic website, www.novacat.com, or you can find me on Instagram as the Cat LVT. Just keep in mind that I don't give out free veterinary advice, so I will bump you and tell you to go to your local veterinary office if you're having a problem. But I do love sharing all of my fascinating cases that we have at the clinic. And if you are a rescue, you're always more than welcome to ask me questions about neonates as well. Ellen, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? I think we're good to go. Other than, you know, if you have those little kittens, kudos to you. There are a lot of work. Just make sure you do it right and, you know, keep on learning. Babies are, are a hard thing, but they're 100% worth it if you're going to take the time and dedication to work with those little neonates. 
Thanks for listening to the Community Cats podcast. If you could go to iTunes and review the show, we'd really appreciate it. When you do, take a screenshot of your review, go to communitycatspodcast.com forward slash review and enter your information and we'll send you a t-shirt. While you're there, don't forget to check out all the ways you can support the content you're passionate about. Thanks, everyone. Wow.